So, our next presentation is from uh, Professor Kapayeridis, entitled Machine Learning Based Systems Application to Mineral Resource Estimation and Compliance with Reporting Codes for Mineral Resources. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for and the introduction. You have two, three minutes more. Okay, I, I'm sure I'm not going to need that, perhaps for questions. Uh, okay, my name is Yanis Kapagaridis. I'm from the University of uh, Western Macedonia. And uh, our presentation today, our first presentation, is about machine learning based systems application to mineral resource estimation and compliance with reporting codes for mineral resources. Okay, do I have to point somewhere? I'm okay, right. Uh, so a few words about this uh, presentation. Uh, for people involved in uh, mineral resources estimation and uh, reporting, for some years now we have international reporting codes that have been developed and adopted by the mining industry to raise the standards of produce reports and in increase confidence in uh, mining investments. It is a requirement for all companies listed in uh, exchanges to uh, submit uh, reports for their mineral resources and mineral reserves that are following the guidelines and the standards of these reporting codes. So they set minimum standards, recommendations, and guidelines for public reporting of exploration results, mineral resources, and mineral reserves as you can see, we use capital letters for all of them because they, they are significant and uh, people should treat them as such. Uh, there's a great economic impact behind all of these words. So uh, this is uh, communicated to everyone involved. Now, machine learning algorithms have been used in various steps of mineral resource estimation in the last four decades and have found recently their way into commercially available software products. Uh, frankly, everybody is jumping the machine learning wagon uh, nowadays. All the software companies that are into uh, mineral resource estimation, mine planning, and so on, they're trying to uh, include uh, machine learning and AI techniques in general. Uh, some of that, in my view, is very, uh, very much related to marketing because it's, a, uh, it's something like a, a fashion and uh, everybody has to do it. Uh, now, due to the automated nature of these algorithms and the associated time saving, estimation practitioners tend to accept the results with little knowledge and control of how they work. So in this presentation, we'll try to identify and discuss the compliance issues related to the application of uh, machine learning based systems to mineral resource estimation particularly uh, under the prism of the reporting codes. And uh, to make it clear, I'm all in for machine learning. Uh, I'm very uh, favorable of uh, uh, expanding their use. All of my research was on machine learning. So I'm not trying to be negative about it. I'm just trying to say that when you're trying to replace uh, some existing methodologies like explicit geological modeling or geostatistics with something else, the same rules of transparency and uh, uh, good practice should be applied to machine learning as well. So, some uh, overview of how this uh, application developed over the years. They have been gradually introduced to vari various tasks related to mineral resource estimation since the 80s. You could say that the 80s and the early 90s were like the first renaissance of uh, machine learning, especially for mining. Um, by the early 90s, a few ML methods have been developed and implemented in the commercial available software. It was related to mostly simple tasks, such as variogram model fitting and sample clustering. Early 90s were also a time when artificial intelligence techniques received a lot of attention from the scientific community, including people involved in geostatistics and mineral resource estimation. 
Extra systems, artificial neural networks, genetic algorithms, they were all used as the basis of quite a few research projects in the field. And it was a common belief that AI techniques could be combined with or eventually even replace geostatistics. Now, after a few years, of course, of a lot of research, most of these techniques, because they were and still are computationally intensive, and the hardware we had at the time was not capable of producing results within acceptable time limits, they led a lot of that research to remain at the prototype level, never reaching the implementation stage and becoming a commercially available tool to the mining industry. The general conception that machine learning techniques are black box approaches, combined with the development of reporting standards for reporting of mineral resources and reserves in the late 80s, early 90s, also pushed estimation practitioners away from adopting machine learning techniques for critical tasks such as geological modeling or grade estimation. Basically anything that had an economic impact to a mining operation on the side of mineral resource estimation. Now recently, uh, the speed of current computing systems, personal or cloud-based, has allowed for complex models to be built using machine learning algorithms within minutes, leading to a few commercial implementations becoming available to mineral resource estimation practitioners and gaining their acceptance as reliable systems with practice, with a lot of good results. The successful application of machine learning systems in other areas related to mining has also paved the way for the acceptance of machine learning for mineral resource estimation tasks. In the last decade, and this is important, several mineral resource estimation reports, part of various levels of study from preliminary economic assessments to feasibility studies, were based to some extent on the results of machine learning algorithms application. And of course, estimation practitioners, uh, they were always like this, but in the, uh, last few years it's even more so, they're always under pressure to produce results quickly and keep costs down to take advantage of commodity demand and price cycles, sometimes at the expense of maintaining a good practice and a good standard in conducting technical and economic assessments. This is just a, a diagram of some of the available machine learning techniques. There are too many to mention. I'm not showing this to try to uh, show you what there is out there. There's too many of them. Not all of them are related to, mass to mineral resource estimation, but quite a few of them have been involved, uh, have been included in some steps, like neural networks, clustering methods, regressors, dimension, dimensionality reducers, and so on. Okay, some of these have been used. Even fewer have been implemented into commercial software for mine planning. But there are a lot of them, and it's obviously quite difficult for uh, a mining engineer or a geologist to have enough experience to be confident in using them. So where do we use them? These are just some examples, and the list is not complete by any means, and nor the list of tasks or the list of tools that we can address these tasks with, like experimental variography and variogram model fitting. We can use regression methods, and we have been using regression methods for that. Any autofit option we have in this software will use some kind of orthogonal least squares method to do that, or some clustering method, surface fitting, again with recursion methods, sample dimensionality reduction with PCA and other reducers, samples classification with uh, support vector machines, neural networks, clustering, and so on. And of course, something which has been, has been very popular lately, or the last few years, geological and resource estimation domain modeling. This task has been, is always very time consuming and hard to do it explicitly. So uh, all the software companies have tried to produce uh, tools based on machine learning to take this uh, uh, trouble away from the geologist, basically. And also spatial interpolation or grade estimation which has been done mostly by neural networks or some combination of neural networks and Kriging. This has yet to become something uh, uh, official and something implemented properly into commercial software because it's quite complicated. 
And of course, the optimization of uh, grade estimation parameters, as any other optimization of parameters that can be done using genetic algorithms. And the list is not complete, of course, as I said, there's plenty others. Now, uh, we should talk about a bit about the reporting codes as well, because our presentation is uh, seeing things through the, through the eyes of the reporting codes. They have been adopted by and included in the listing rules of the relevant securities exchanges and impose specific requirements on exploration and mining companies reporting to these exchanges. Furthermore, the codes have been adopted by relevant professional bodies, so everyone involved in this process and being uh, a member of one of these bodies is forced uh, or uh, should be using them in any way. And uh, you can see a list of the most popular ones or the most major ones. The list again is not complete. Almost every country that has some significant mining activity will have its own reporting code. You can see here JORG, which is the uh, Solasian one, PERC for Europe, SAMREC and SAMVAL in South Africa, and of course the National Instrument 43101 of the Canadian Securities Administrators. And I would say that JORG and the National Instrument are the most uh, significant ones in this list. So the main principles governing the operation and application of most reporting codes are transparency, adequate information is presented cl clearly to the public, materiality considers all relevant information available at the date of reporting, and competence. Work is prepared by suitably qualified and experienced competent persons. All codes make reference to a competent or qualified person, or CP for short, defined more or less in the same way as to qualifications, experience, and certification. It's important to keep these words in mind, particularly transparency and competence, because there are certain implications when we use techniques like, like uh, techniques based on machine learning in uh, producing results that are reported using these reporting codes. So transparency. It is important to provide transparent and consistent reporting of mineral resources and reserves and study outcomes and to provide a discussion on the expected accuracy, precision and confidence levels of the estimate. If the assumptions related to the reported estimates are not made transparent by the competent person, then one competent person may report different mineral resources, quantities and qualities to another, even using the same data. So the question is, how can competent persons responsible for the report and the practitioners involved in producing the estimates make these assumptions transparent when they don't on, and or can't understand the system they have used to produce them? Of course, you can say that even for geostatistics, but then for geostatistics, you have tons of information available to the practitioner, okay? And uh, the companies are very forthcoming about them. In fact, it doesn't depend on the companies that are using the software, but it depends on the people who develop geostatistics in general. So for decades, everybody knows or can know how to apply efficiently geostatistics and explicit geological methods, but how many people know in the mining industry, how to apply machine learning. So we have an issue here. And then of course we have competence and that those two are linked together, okay? They're not separate, okay? They are being separated so we can uh, stress them more. Even though competence mostly refers, according to the reporting codes, to the experience in the style of mineralization or type of deposit under consideration, the issue we are uh, dealing with here lies not with the definition of the competent person, but with the related duties of the competent, per or competent person responsible for producing the estimate. When it comes to machine learning methods, there are very few competent persons with related knowledge. Okay, this is my personal view, but I, I think I'm quite close to, uh, to the reality. Okay, but still, they will accept, you know, the outcome of some software package just because everybody's using it. Okay, and that's not good. In the past, we had examples of software being like a monopoly, like Whittle for pit optimization, for example. Everybody was optimizing open pits using Whittle, but Whittle, which was a separate company at the time, had a manual this thick about how Whittle worked. Okay, the information was there. They were not hiding anything, okay? 
So the automated, ah, the available knowledge of how commercially available machine learning based systems work is very limited as the software vendors are commonly protective of their intellectual property. And that brings us engineers and geologists in a difficult position when we're trying to use these tools to produce something which is compliant with the reporting codes. In fact, even if we don't consider the reporting codes and you consider good practice, how can you possibly claim that you know what you're doing when you don't know how your software works? Okay. So the automated nature of these systems also leaves the competent persons with little control of how results are produced. That's another issue. Because they're automated systems and because they have been hard-coded to work in a specific manner, you cannot intervene with how they work. So you don't know how they work and you cannot control how they work. So difficult situation. Okay, so it's, it's putting competent people in a difficult position, not being able to effectively report the assumptions and the associated risks. Now, to complete this presentation, okay, some recommendations. I see three different parts being uh, playing a role uh, in how we resolve this situation. First of all, the software vendors, they need to provide information on how their system work. They don't have to go into showing us the code. They can just tell us what uh, system it is, so we'll know how it behaves, okay? That will allow the estimation practitioner to be competent in using them. And uh, for the produced report to satisfy reporting code requirements for transparency. They also have to provide more controls. That is difficult to do, of course, because the architecture of the system has to allow for it, okay? If it doesn't, then it's difficult. And uh, when we talk about geological controls, how you introduce them to a machine learning based system, can be quite difficult to do, like folds and folds and whatever. I'm not a geologist, so I'm not gonna go into that, okay? And they also need to integrate measures of confidence of the results produced by the ML-based system. They should be clearly explained as to how they are calculated and how they should be interpreted, okay? So when we use, when we have Kriging variance, everybody knows what Kriging variance is, okay? So they can understand what is a value in Kriging variance. When I get some arbitrary confidence measure that I haven't, haven't got a clue how it works or how it's been calculated, what can I do with it? Okay, I cannot do much with it. Now, there's no excuse for the practitioner side, okay? They need to maintain competency by learning the principles of the systems they use, particularly when they're based on machine learning through personal development, and they will they should at all times, no matter what system they use, of course, adhere to the principles of reporting codes and good practice in general, and not sacrifice them for time and effort saving. And of course, in the academia, we also have the responsibility that, uh, you know, our side of this, our part of this, we should incorporate machine learning and, uh, and AI in undergraduate and postgraduate study programs for engineers and geologists. There is no excuse for that. In this country, we're very slow in introducing anything new. Even geostatistics, which has been here for decades, it's, you know, it's just a, 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 you know, a topic on the side. It's not something major, okay? And then you have resource geologists out there, not learning the necessary skills in the university. Even worse when we talk about machine learning and uh, AI. And of course, we should also incorporate subjects related to reporting codes, risk management, and investment analysis. This is particularly for engineers, but also for geologists. And with that, I have concluded my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Kapagiaridis. Uh, is there any questions in the audience? Your presentation was very interesting. I am not an expert, but I would like to ask how is the efficiency of a machine learning based system verified? Yeah, that's a, that is an issue. It's, it's been verified only by the results. Okay, we compare the results to whatever view we have of uh, the reality, let's say, and we don't have right now statistical measures of uh, their performance. 
because even though in most of the algorithms related to, especially supervised ones, uh, related to machine learnings, they give you some measures of what they're doing. In fact, they, they monitor their performance th throughout their development. Uh, the, this is not information which is available to the people who use them through a commercial package. If you are doing research, of course, in machine learning and applying it to mineral resource estimation, you have measures and you can develop perhaps things, but these are not currently available to end users of uh, particular software systems. So right now we don't have very good uh, uh, you know, measures of uh, their performance. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I see that we have no questions online. Okay. I will ask a question oh. to Professor Kapayeridis. <laughs> uh, I agree with you that uh, indeed uh, geoscientists in general should be introduced to these uh, advanced uh, techniques which have become more and more incorporated in uh, abroad in uh, not only mining but in geosciences uh, generally in the approach. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, a solution could be, also could be a good relation between uh, geoscientists and people who are uh, um, special, specialized in the algorithmic part? So the two communities should be brought together. Yeah, ideally more, uh, uh, you shouldn't just have the developers who are yes. computer programmers. Yeah. Uh, just sitting there writing software for the mining industry, for example, yeah. or for the geologists. Uh, they should be uh, teamed with uh, people from the industry, okay? And uh, this not only this doesn't apply just for machine learning based mm -hmm. systems, this applies to everything, of course, okay? The, the best systems, uh, the best tools we have have been developed, uh, they have, their development has been driven by people who are of that particular industry and not just computer programmers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, yes, the answer is yes, definitely. In order to adapt, to better adapt course, their algorithms mean, into the applications yeah, in yeah. which we are all working. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, in and geoscience, I mean, in, in general geoscience, machine learning has been there for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we have more trouble uh, applying them in the minerals industry because of the economic impact of all the decisions. Okay, it's more uh, critical economically. So it's very difficult to just accept some algorithm mm -hmm. that you never saw before and hasn't mm -hmm. been tested for years in the industry uh, to produce results, especially under the <laughs> reporting codes we have. Mm -hmm. So hopefully with this presentation, you know, just uh, to bring these concerns out to people. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Kapageridis.